Hi guys, James at Rampant Live Reviews again for you today with another beer review. For this one, we are going to stick to Scotland and we're going to continue on with this little mini series of reviews that I've been doing for you recently that I've entitled Crazy Beers for 10 years. And the whole idea behind this is, of course, to celebrate 10 years of Rampant Live Reviews being up here on YouTube and we've been looking at some beers that I've been sitting on for a number of years. So the beer that we're going to have a look at today is from a brewery that is featured on the channel many times before. These guys may well still be the most reviewed brewery here on the channel in fact, but they are run close by one or two others maybe. But uh, I would credit this brewery with having helped get me into the American style craft beers. These guys were very, very big when I was studying chemistry and just getting into the whole craft beer thing. But the beer itself is a style that I know these guys can do very well, one that we've reviewed on the channel from them many times before. And we have been looking at a few that have been aged a number of years on the channel as well. So I'm really curious to see what this one is going to have in store for us because this one is a little bit more kind of raw, I guess we could say, than the other ones we tried. So needless to say, I'm very curious to see what this one is going to have in store for us. Hopefully it's another good beer. Hopefully it makes for an interesting review. And as always, I hope that you guys watching enjoy my take on this one as well. So uh, yeah, for this review then, we are going to head up to Aberdeenshire in the northeastern part of Scotland. We're going to go to a little place of Ellen, just to the north of the city of Aberdeen, where I used to study chemistry. Loved my time up there. But that means that we're going to have a look at yet another beer from Brewdog. So this particular beer is called Old World Russian Imperial Stout. It comes in at 9.5% ABV, and I believe this beer was released back in uh, about 2013 or something like that, if memory serves me correctly. Uh, it might have been a little bit after that, but I'm honestly not 100% sure. But the best before date on this one is the 17th of October 2018, so we're actually drinking this one nearly five years out of date, but with it being 9.5% uh, Imperial Stout, I don't think we're going to have uh, too much bother with this one, to be honest with you. So back when this beer was released, I honestly, as I say, can't remember the exact day that it was released. It was released along with the Old World uh, India Paleo, which was quite an interesting one. I think that was about 7 or 8%, and it was brewed with uh, English Fugles hops. It was supposed to be like the, the style was back in the day. So yeah, I reviewed that one because that style obviously wouldn't have lasted if we'd aged it. But this one... I thought would last. And this is kind of interesting compared to the other Brewdog Stouts that I've reviewed for you for this anniversary, mainly because it's uh, it's a little bit lower in EBV. The other ones were like, you know, 15% and things. And this one isn't badly. This is like a raw, uh, straight up, untwisted, uh, unplayed with Imperial Stout. So yeah, this could make for a really interesting review. I've seen folk drink that have checked this one in recently on Untapped, and it still seems like it's in good drinking condition. So yeah, I thought it was time to, to open this guy up and see what it's all about. So yeah, let's crack on with this one then and see how we got on. The Old World Imperial Stout at 9.5% ABV uh, from uh, Brewdog in Ellen in Aberdeenshire in Scotland. So as always with my reviews then, I'll tell you a little bit about the brewery before we taste the beer. If you want to get straight to the tasting though, just fast forward. All the usual links can be found in the video description below. That's the brewery website, the link to my other reviews that I've done from Brewdog before. And we will see about adding some more to that list at some point in the near future. I do quite fancy having a look at some other beers from the Paradox series, which we've been doing recently. And we'll see if they release anything else interesting as time goes on. But there's all the usual social media down there. If you want to see more reviews, do please consider subscribing to the channel. The support that you give is massively appreciated. And remember, you can go into the channel homepage and search for beer using the geography tagging system. So just go in there, use the little search bar, put in your hometown, state, county, whatever you like. If I've reviewed beers from the area that you search for, they will pop up. Failing that, though, you can check out the playlist of beers from different countries. You'll find this one in the Scottish playlist, along with a number of other things. And we can, of course... Uh, we can of course uh, continue to we will of course continue to add to that and you can check out the playlist of beers from other countries a little bit of a brain fart there but let's go on and do a little bit of chatting about Brewdog itself brewery history time so 
Uh, Brewdog, as, as I've mentioned to you already, are based in Ellen in Aberdeenshire in the north of Scotland. And the company was founded back in 2007 by James Watt and Martin Dickey in the Keswick Industrial Estate in Fraserburgh on the very northeastern kind of tip of Scotland, the nose of the monster, as I like to call it, because Scotland does look a bit like a monster's head. Uh, but both of these guys studied at Harriet Watt University down in Edinburgh. James studied law and economics, while Martin studied in the brewing and distilling programme. And after graduation, he went on to work for Thornbridge Brewery down in England for about two years. But uh, after this, the two friends decided they wanted to start up their own company, and so they got busy with it. But these guys are known for being a very experimental brewery, and particularly at one stage for their strong beers, actually. Um, they, were, they had the Tactical Nuclear Penguin, the Sink, the Bismarck, and the End of History, which were done as a sort of duel with uh, Schorschbräu from uh, Germany. But they are largely inspired by the American craft brewing renaissance and stone brewing over in California in particular. If you try the, if you try the original punk IPA and then tried the stone IPA, you could really see what they were going for. But of course, um, uh, more recently, in 2012, they moved their main brewing operations up to Ellen, or down to Ellen, we should say, because they were in Fraserburgh before. But that is a little bit closer to the city of Aberdeen, where I used to study. But they started up a new purpose-built and very fancy facility there, uh, and a lot of that was done through their equity for punk scheme that they had, where fans of the brewery could buy shares, and the brewery would in turn use this to invest in their infrastructure. But they've continually expanded over the years, and quite a lot of it was done using this method. But in more recent years, it's been done by capital to investment from private sources. Uh, but they've got various bars across the world. Uh, they started opening these in 2010 with the original bar across the road from Marshall College in Aberdeen City Centre. The following year they expanded them down to Glasgow and Edinburgh and then in London as well. But uh, in recent years they've just been expanding that pub chain. I think the furthest ones away are probably Sao Paulo in Brazil and uh, Tokyo over in Japan. Well, they have got some down in Australia as well. And uh, yeah, they have another brewery. They opened up a second brewery in Columbus in Ohio over in the US. Then they took over Stone's Brewing, Stone Brewing Facility in, uh, in Berlin in Germany. And they now also have a brewery in Brisbane in Australia too. So in total they have four breweries. Uh, they started distilling spirits under the name Lone Wolf Distillery. I believe most of those are done at the facility in Ellen in Aberdeenshire and they've got an overworks the facility called Overworks up there which produces lots of different kind of sour beers and they started releasing beers from that facility in 2019 but apparently today they produce in the region of 800,000 hectolitres of beer worldwide and uh, if we go back to it my personal favourite beers from this brewery would have been, uh, you know, the, the Hardcore IPA was my favourite back in the day, 5am Saint was great uh, I also enjoyed Electric India, this lovely hoppy saison. Riptide was a really nice kind of sweet stout, sort of 8% ABV, but Dogma Scotch Ale was always quite a special one too. But uh, as of August 2023, when I'm filming this review for you, these guys have produced around 550 different kinds of beer according to Untapped. Uh, I'm not sure if that includes all the ones that have been done in the little outposts and things that brew their own stuff. But uh, yeah, they've got various uh, side hustles with the business as well. They've got a hotel at the brewery in Ellen and Aberdeen, uh, in Aberdeenshire. They've also got a hotel at the one in Columbus in Ohio. I think they've got some hotels in London. I think maybe one at Brisbane as well, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, yeah, these guys have expanded a hell of a lot over the years. And they are one of the most recognisable craft beer brands in the world. But they have not been without controversy, of course. The behaviour of James Watt has been very, very questionable over the years. And, uh, yeah, I know from uh, people local uh, to the brewery in Ellen and things like that that they've done some pretty shitty things, like try to bully Aberdeenshire Council because they wouldn't sell them the land that they wanted. Uh, despite making counter offers, they were trying to bully the them into putting the price down and all this kind of thing. But yeah, uh, Brewdog have behaved really shittily over the years. Let's just put it uh, that way. And a lot of that is down to James Watt. Martin Dickey, who I met, was uh, always very down to earth, very, very nice guy. And uh, when it came to the beer, you know, Stuart Bowman was what, was the main man who kind of put Brewdog on the map. And of course, Franz, the German guy that was there as well, they were great. And once they left, the, the quality of the beer went down. But it has been kind of steadily improving again over the years but I would say from the beer perspective the stouts all have stayed pretty good it's the IPAs and the lighter stuff that's kind of dropped in quality to be honest with you but some of the big imperial stouts and things are still pretty decent actually and the thing you have to say about Brudo is that they have got people drinking better beer they have raised awareness 
about craft beer, of course. But uh, yeah, I think that's everything we can really say about BrewDog for the moment. If you want to learn more about these guys, you can check out the brewery website, but be aware it is like a little bit like Russian and Chinese propaganda these days, so take it with a pinch of salt. Uh, go and have a read about the, the brewery, watch the documentaries and all this kind of thing, and you'll get an idea of uh, what BrewDog are all about. But yeah, let's go on and have a little look at the beer itself then. Enough about that. So, just to let you have a little look at the artwork on this one before we open up, you can see this is proper old school BrewDog. It's got the old BrewDog symbol on it, which I absolutely love. When BrewDog were good, uh, were well, morally intact, I guess, for the most part, you could say. But yeah, um, you've got a really nice... Uh, label on this one and quite similar to what we had with the, the other one. I think I still have the bottle for the um, the IPA somewhere and it was quite similar but it was darker blue uh, and you will find that review on the channel of course but plain silver top on the bottle cap there it tells you a little bit about the beer uh, on the side here. So um, Old World is our tribute to the great genre of genre defining beers of yesteryear. We wanted to pay homage to the roots of one of the beer styles which have powered the craft beer revolution more than any others. Uh, Imperial Russian Stout. These beers are designed to be liquid time machines taking you back to the origins of a beer style we all love today. Both beers have been beautifully hand drawn labels by Johanna, uh, Johan Johanna Basford which intricately depict the story and heritage of the style. So, yeah, um, gently crafted by hand in Scotland, this old world stout perfectly recreates the imperial beers of years gone by, brewed to the traditional percentage of alcohol, 9.5% 9, 9 by volume, to avoid freezing during its journey across the Baltic Sea to snowy Moscow. Uh, all full-bodied taste, I didn't know that was the case, that they would freeze, it's kind of cool to know, but all full-bodied taste, this opulent whirl of hops and malt even rivals the most colourful of Imperial Fabergé eggs. Originally created to celebrate the Russian royal family, this beer is a fitting tribute with which to toast your own empire, Brewdog. So, um, yeah, as we said, 9.5% Imperial Stout, this one. Um, it says on the, uh, on the untapped page, uh, they had a list of the ingredients, so I wrote this into the brewery notes. Uh, this one is hopped with Magnum, Cascade, Galena and Columbus, all hops that are quite commonly used in Imperial Stouts. In fact, all of them American. Um, Magnum is going to give you quite a nice big spicy floral character, as is Columbus. Galena is going to give you a little bit of the more kind of uh, blackberry, black currenty, fruity character. I forget what alpha acid percentage Galena is, but then you've got Cascade, which is the classic American hop, it's going to give you lots of figs and plums and stuff like that, but that's about 8% alpha acid. The malt base in this one is extra pale, oat smoked wheat, uh, flaked oats, uh, dark crystal, chocolate, carafa and black malt. So um, yeah, I think this should make for, really interest, for a really interesting review. So let's get this guy out into the glass then and see what it's all about. I'm really, really curious to try this. A 9.5% proper old school. Russian Imperial Stout from Brewdog. Um, yeah, let's do this then. Ooh, that does look nice. I think that's enough to have a little look at at the moment. Uh, this bottle, incidentally, I forgot to say that it's a 660 milliliter one, not like a 750 or whatever, uh, not like a bomber or anything like that. But yeah, this beer looks absolutely great. So it's poured pretty much as you would expect for an Imperial Stout. Um, so you can see the head on this one. It's got a little bit of soapy, bubbly character to it, but you can see that the beer has poured with about a half finger of a frothy, kind of bumpy, I would say medium to dark tan head. I think the light's reflecting off it a little bit too much at that angle, but you can see it there, kind of medium sized bubbles on the surface, foamier ones a little bit above that, then the more kind of soapy bigger bubbles up toward the top of the head. But you can see this beer is uh, a lovely big dark ebony rosewood colour, it looks absolutely great. But um, yeah, I really do like how this one, uh, this one goes together, it's pretty much as you would expect. So remember the colour of your beer depends on a few things. One, the type of malts that you use. This goes a long way to determining your EBC rating. Two, length of your wort boil is also going to play a role because the longer you boil the wort, the more the sugars caramelise and thus you get a darker colour of beer. But any barrel ageing that you do or adjuncts you put into the beer will affect the colour of it as well. But uh, yeah, you don't often have to care about that when it comes to black beers because it's very difficult to affect 
uh, the appearance of these beers with adjuncts and barrel aging to be honest and um, you can do it with the more brown sugary beers but not really the black beers uh, but yeah if you shine the light through this one you can see it is actually pretty damn hazy and you would kind of expect that when there's wheat and oats in this one they're going to be the big things that contribute to the, the kind of uh, opaqueness of the beer, I think that's probably the correct word but yeah, not much in the way of visible carbonation with this one, one or two big bubbles sticking toward the side of the glass, a few little ones going up toward the bottom of the head there but overall, it does look very nice I have to say, so yeah uh, the head has faded away to just be a very thin foamy layer, but you've got that kind of soapy ring just around the edge of the glass, but let's have a wee look at the aroma of this one then and just see what it's all about, I think this could be interesting oh yeah that does smell good. This is going to be pretty ni pretty nice, actually. I just wish I knew how old this beer was. I honestly can't remember, and it didn't say on the Untapped page either when it was uh, when it was released. But it smells absolutely beautiful. Big, big, silky imperial stout. This one, you can smell. It gives you everything you'd want. A lot of sweetness, bit of roastiness, lovely fruity character. This is going to be good. So let's just break the aroma of this one down a little bit more and describe it for you in depth as we always do. So yeah, the backbone of this beer, you do get a lovely little bit of, you get a mix of, there, there is a kind of slightly woody character to this one and you do get this with beers that have been aged a good little bit. So you can smell the lovely big kind of um, silky uh, woody character in there. You've got a lovely little bit of a roasty, toasty, well-fired bread crust as well, and that's going to come from both the black malt and the carafa that's in this one. So yeah, that's definitely there. Um, you do get a little bit of an almost kind of rye bready character coming out of the beer as well. So yeah, lovely little bit of rye bready character in there. Um, there are little elements of kind of nuttiness to this beer as well. So you've got a lovely little bit of nuttiness in there. A little bit of a wholemeal brown bread too. But I'm getting a lot of kind of like chocolate muffin, chocolate brownie type uh, type character coming out of the beer, which is really interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. The way that that goes together is um, it's really quite nice, in fact. So for me, the... Yeah, for me, the kind of, the roasty toasty um, notes in this one are really balanced out by the big sort of chocolate brownie, chocolate muffin type character that you get out of this. It's really lovely and silky. As I say, you get a few kind of nutty characters just uh, pushing their way out of this one. So, uh, yeah, on top of that, Yeah, on top of that, you get a really nice kind of, um, on top of that, you get lovely kind of, um, how would you say, you get lovely sort of, just a mix of chocolate. I mean, you do get a little bit of that higher 70, 80% cocoa chocolate coming out of this one, which is great. Uh, so yeah, lovely 70, 80% cocoa chocolate. Uh, uh, you can feel that it kind of mellows out you do get some milky chocolate elements out of this one as well a little bit of an almost uh, yeah a little bit of an almost kind of vanilla type quality to this beer as well which I think is quite interesting so yeah you've got that chocolate layer there which is quite dry but you do get an element of brown sugar out of this one so for me, there is a little bit of like a treacle molasses in this one, and it does have a wee bit of an almost leathery character. And usually with Imperial Stouts, there's kind of two ways you can take them to thicken up the mouthfeel. You, well, you can obviously use wheat and oats in there, but one of the things to do is to give them a longer wort boil. And usually if they do this, you can tell by how leathery and dry the brown sugars are. And I am getting some of that vibe in here. The other thing you can do with these beers, of course, is to make them double mash. But with this one being only 9.5% ABV, I don't think they've gone down the double mash route with this one. If you go double mash, you're probably going to get at least you know 12% or something like that out of the beer. And um, that might be an overestimation, but yeah, still, 
Uh, and if they're doing an old school version of this, I don't think they really did double mashing back in the days, to be honest with you. But um, yeah, on top of the chocolate, you do get lovely brown sugars and they're lovely big kind of leathery brown sugary character. So yeah, lovely big leathery sort of brown sugar, good little bit of a toasty sort of thing in there. And then, uh, yeah, you do get elements of like sweet caramel in there, but mainly it's a big sort of uh, leathery um, kind of brown sugar. So, yeah, that's really interesting. I'm curious to see how this is going to turn out in the flavour, but malty wise, it smells very, very good. Um, and this might well be the lowest ABV aged stout that I've tried, actually, come to think of it. Um, other than. Although those are porters, really. I was thinking of the Ola Duf from uh, from Harveston. That because that would have been an exception. Um, but yeah, it does smell nice. I will say that. So on the, I think we said everything we need to put the malty side of the beer. On the hoppy side of things, it is kind of what you'd expect. So remember, um, imperial stouts are not the most hop forward styles of beer. The focus is on is quite rightly on the malt. But you do still get a bit of hoppiness to them, and having that little bit of hoppiness in there can be quite—it uh, can be quite interesting. We should say that. So, for me, the yeah, for me the um yeah the the way that this one goes together, I think, is really nice as well. Um, you get a little bit of earthiness in there. You do still get a little bit of herbal character at this one, but you do still get a good bit of the floral aromaticity out of this. I mean, you know, the Columbus uh, and the, the Galena and the uh, the Magnum, those are all going to give you a nice big kind of floral component, so you can still smell a little bit of a bright floral character to this one. It is a little bit wet and leafy, like you do have this kind of wet, leafy grassiness at the front of the nose too. And that's really interesting. It's really interesting how with this beer being, it's got to be at least eight years old. Uh, but with this beer being as old as it is, it's interesting that that has lingered there for sure. So we need to see how that transpires in the flavour. But beyond that, the last thing to talk about in the aroma is the fruity character. And I mean, for me, the fruity side of this beer is as you'd expect. You've got a lovely kind of sharp raisiny note to it. Big, big oily plum, of course. Um, I do get quite a lot of fig. And you've got a mix, you've got quite a, a lot of black berry out of this one, but maybe just a little touch of a more oily black currant underneath it. But these are all things we've seen in the style before, but um, I will say that it goes together. The aroma of this one is very, very nice. And it's quite interesting for me to see, like having tried quite a few aged stouts close together, you really do start to see how the you get this sort of silky oily, um, chocolatey note out of the beer a little bit more, the older it gets. So that's an interesting point to make about um, these beers from the aroma perspective. Because, you know, I've had older stouts every so often, but now that I've tried a few fairly close together, it's just something that's really kind of clicked in my brain there. So this is the whole point of the channel. You're always learning stuff about beer. And I think that's great. Me too, me included. So, yeah. Um, as I always say though, take a bit of time to just enjoy the aroma of the beer before you get stuck into it. But I think it is about time that we try this one. So yeah, this is the Old World um, Russian Imperial Stout. 9.5% ABV, uh, originally part of a pair, including the IPA, from Brewdog in Ellen, in Aberdeenshire. In the northeast of Scotland. Let's get stuck into this one. Slanju, Skoll, cheers. That is nice. I'm going to say straight away, on the first sip, you're going to be surprised at how silky this thing is. But then, just as the palate kind of gets used to it, you get everything that you'd expect. You've got the carafa. I love the way carafa goes about its business. We'll talk about that later. But yeah, you get the lovely big roasty, toasty, woody, brown bready, and every, you know, cakey and everything else notes. Just pushing their way out of this one, it's great.
yeah, the way the beer goes together, I think, is uh, is really nice. It gets a big thumbs up for me. This is a beautiful, beautiful beer, and uh, I do really like how everything just kind of pieces together with it. Um, yeah, it definitely gets a big thumbs up from me. I'm happy with this. Um, yeah, it's aged really quite nicely. Uh, yeah, so let's just break the beer down and describe it for you a bit more in depth, as we always do. We'll start on that middle third of the palate, of course. So the backbone of the beer, you've got that lovely, smooth, um, you've got that lovely, very smooth, um, just almost like it's like a kind of woody character, but at the same time you get that really roasty, toasty, well-fired, morning roll, bread crusty type quality. So, yeah. The way that that goes together is really nice. Above the kind of roasty, toasty, well-fired bread crust, as you'd expect, you get a kind of layer of rye bread, and the rye bread's kind of nice. It has it's a little bit of a drier rye bread, but it does still give you. A wee bit of the the kind of sweetness that you'd expect from a bit of a rye bready layer. So yeah, you've got the roasty well fired bread crust uh, mixed in with a bit of woody character. You get the kind of sweeter rye bread, and then above that you get the more kind of wholemeal brown bready character, which is nice. Uh, and the wholemeal brown bready character has a little bit more of a lighter, airy sort of vibe to it. But you can feel that within that wholemeal brown bready character, you start to get some of the sort of nutty notes coming out of the beer, which I think are, are absolutely great. So yeah, the way that everything goes together in this beer, I think, is uh, it's really quite nice. And as I say, it gets a big thumbs up from me on the malty side of things. So I was saying earlier, we were talking about the carafa. The carafa has this, for me, carafa has this very distinctive, smooth, but still roasty and toasty, well-fired, like morning roll, bread crusty quality. And you get that, I think, a little bit further forward on that middle third of your palate in this one. But it also gives you just this slight kind of dry, rye bready character. And you can really feel that, as I say, toward the front of that middle third of your palate. And I think, I think that's great. That one, I, I really do like how that uh, kind of pieces together, actually. But on the, um, yeah, on top of the, um, on top of the kind of wholemeal brown bread layer that I was talking about, you start to get some of the more kind of cakey elements out of the beer. Uh, as I say, this beer, it has a little bit of like a chocolate, a more dense like chocolate brownie, chocolate muffin. Uh, type layer two, so that just sits above the wholemeal brown bread for me. And so yeah, the further into the further into that layer of the beer that you, go, the further into the beer that you go, the more that layer becomes apparent. You do get more and more of it. The further into the aftertaste you'll go, but above the kind of cakey. Um, above the kind of cakey, um, yeah, above the sort of cakey chocolate muffiny layer, you get the chocolate, and the chocolate's quite interesting for me because at the very back of that middle third of your palate, it's a very like charred, very dark chocolate. But as you move further forward toward the middle of that um, middle third of your palate, you're almost right in the centre you do get like a sort of 80-90% cocoa chocolate and as you move further forward beyond that toward the front of that middle third of your palate you're getting a wee bit more of like a um, you're getting a little bit more of a kind of you know 60-70% cocoa chocolate so that's quite nice but above the chocolate layer you do start to get some of the kind of leathery brown sugar notes that I was talking about and I do wonder if this beer had a slightly longer wort boil, maybe like you know six hours or something like that. But you can, you know, I know that Nerd Brewing, for example, in Malmo in Sweden, they leave their beers, uh, they leave the wort to boil for absolutely ages. So yeah, that's worth uh, thinking about with these beers too. Um, yeah, 
But for me, yeah, you've got a little bit of a leathery brown sugary layer, then a wee bit of a toasty brown sugary layer on top of that, then in the dead centre of your palate, in that uh, that middle third of your tongue, you can feel there's a wee bit of like a treacle, molasses sort of thing going on with this beer. So, yeah. And yeah, that's absolutely great. Um, yeah, for me, just the way everything pieces together in this beer, I think, is, uh, is really quite nice. So, um, I think that covers the middle third of the palate, to be honest with you, and that's the most complex part of the beer. The only other thing I think I maybe didn't mention so much is that the nutty character comes out a wee bit more the further into the aftertaste that you go to. So, um, yeah, let's... Uh, yeah. Let's uh, move on to the back third of your palate then. So as I've said often with the palate, the sweeter flavours will come out further forward, the more roasty and toasty bitter flavours will come out further back. But the border region between middle and back third of your palate, you do get a nice little bit of kind of bready build up in there. Um, you can feel there's the sort of rye bready character on the base and the more wholemeal brown bready character on the top. And what you often get with the back third of your palate is the flavours are very similar to the middle third of your palate. They just come out at different intensities. Uh, and they will be a little bit more, pardon me, bitter and dry too. So yeah, the base of that back third of your palate, you've got this lovely, again, roasty, toasty, well-fired bread crust. It's, as I say, it just feels a little bit drier. You get a wee bit of the woody character within that too. But then you get the rye bready layer, which feels a little bit lighter and more airy. Then you get the wholemeal brown bready character, which makes up a, a quite a big chunk of the back third of your palate, and you can feel that in there that it's a lot lighter and more airy than some of the um, kind of roasty, dry brown sugary characters just uh, kind of creep over the top of that, and that's the top of the malty part of your back third of the palate. Then you've got the yeasty side of things that sits above that. So let's have a wee look there. So yeah, the yeasty side of the beer, for me, above everything else, you get this nice kind of, it's like a dense wholemeal brown bready character in there. So it's like this dense, slightly sweeter wholemeal brown bready kind of character. It's sort of wrapped a little bit in, uh, it's wrapped a little bit in a more kind of roasty, toasty, brown sugary type character. Uh, and then it has a little bit more of a kind of farmhousey woody sort of thing there, so yeah, really dense, wholemeal, brown bready character to it, a bit of like honeycomb, toasty brown sugar around it, and yeah, that sits above everything else on the back third of the palate, but you can definitely feel the back third of your palate, the flavour is taller, and as you move further forward into the middle third of your palate, it just kind of condenses down and squashes together that little bit more. So uh, yeah, the way that the beer goes together in that regard, I think, is, um, is really quite nice, and it gets a big... Thumbs up for me. The malty and yeasty side of things in this beer is, is really nice. Yeah, I wish I'd kind of tried this one when it was new as well, and then I had a, or if they, I wish they had re-released it so I could have a look at it. But uh, yeah, it'd be nice to try this one, you know, aged versus new. But as it stands, it is very, very nice. On the, uh, yeah, on the hoppy side of things then, um, back corners of the palate, of course, you've got that nice little bit of earthiness in there. But it's quite smooth, actually. Obviously, a lot of the hoppy character will have dropped out over the years that this beer has been sitting. But yeah, nice little bit of roasty toasty. You know, the, the kind of roasty toasty graininess is mixing in well with the earthiness there. But it smooths out very nicely. You get the lovely smooth earthiness as you move further forward. And as you push toward the kind of front corners of your palate, you get that floral aromaticity coming out of the beer, which I think is absolutely great. So yeah, for me, the way everything goes together in that particular regard is um, is really quite nice. Um, on the, as you say, you've got the earthiness, you've got a little bit of herbal character there as you push further forward, a little bit of floral aromaticity, and round the front curve of the tongue, you've got a wee bit of a lighter sort of grassiness there. And it is quite like a wet, kind of leafy, freshly cut, grassy character that you get out of this beer. Yeah, I like that. I do like that. 
But let's say go to the front third of your palate then and the sort of fruity side of things. So the border region between front third and middle third of your palate, you get a nice little bit of kind of bready build up in there. You've got the sort of rye bready type character uh, coming out of the beer too. So yeah, lovely kind of rye bready character in the base then, the kind of wholemeal brown bread sitting on top of that. The base of that uh, front third of your palate, you've got the roasty, toasty, well fire bread crust. On top of that, you've got the more kind of rye bready sort of thing too. And then, yeah, you've got the lovely kind of smooth uh, characters coming out of the beer too. So, yeah, I think the way that all of that goes together uh, is nice. But then you get that nice oily bubble where the juicy, fruity esters just roll their way out of the beer. So let's have a little look at that kind of fruity side of the beer then. Yeah, it's nice. It's actually kind of slightly juicy. Um, so, yeah, the... The fruity side of the beer for me, it's um, it's it's just really nice. I don't get so much of a sharp raisin in this one as I got from the aroma. But at the back of that front third of your palate, there is a nice kind of yeah. You get a little bit of the there's like a sort of juicy plum in there. Underneath that, you get a little bit of uh, there's a kind of juicy plum in there. Underneath that, you get a little bit of a kind of drier prune. And then as you move further forward into the dead center of that uh, middle of your, uh, that front third of your palate, you get a wee touch of, um, you do get like a little bit of um, kind of, like a, you do get a little bit of juicy fig almost, but then as you move into the front half of that front third of your palate, there's a lovely little bit of like black currant in there and a wee bit of like a kind of black berry. So yeah, the way that everything kind of, pieces together in that regard with this beer I think is uh, is really very very nice um, yeah I do like that about this one yeah the the fruity character is quite soft and it takes a bit of a back seat to everything else this beer is more about the kind of the malty side of things rather than anything else I know that's got a little bit of a smoky character uh, a smoky malty uh, a smoke component in the malt base I should say but it doesn't feel overly smoky you do get a little bit of a kind of woody smokiness out of the beer into the aftertaste but not overly much but this is a really nice imperial stout this one and uh, I really do like how it goes together so like I say, big thumbs up from uh, big thumbs up from me for this one and Brewdog have done a very nice job of this but as I say this was done quite a few years ago when Brewdog were less morally corrupt than they are now so yeah I think we can leave it at that for uh, for this review uh, on the, the tasting side of things, uh, but yeah, on the mouthfeel side, I was almost forgetting about that there, on the mouthfeel, for me, I'd say that this beer, it's like top end of mid-bodied, bottom end of full-bodied. Carbonation is very, very smooth in this one, it's got a lovely sort of silky mouthfeel to it, very slightly oily as well, but more silky rather than anything else. In terms of the IBU count in this beer, I think it's got a, yeah, I think in terms of the IBU count of this beer, it's got a really nice um, mix of dryness and bitterness, so it's hard to say what the calculated bitterness of this beer would have been, but in terms of the perceived bitterness, I think it's probably sitting around the kind of 50, 60 IBU mark. It's not going to blow the head off you, but there is some there. The malt base has a lovely roasty toastiness to it. You've got smoothness in the middle, a dry sweetness on top. That's all really nice. So you've got a bit of bitterness from the hop to mention too. Then you've just got this little bit of uh, wet, ju slightly juicy, fruity character coming out of it. Um, yeah, it's a very... It's not a, an overly pungent beer. This is one of the ones that's more... Um, punchy beers, maybe the better word. This is a beer where it's all about letting the aftertaste develop a little bit more as you quite often do with certain sour beers and things. But um, I think this is really nice and I guess a big thumbs up from me as I've said. So yeah, I think we can leave it at that for this one. So uh, yeah, that was lovely. Really, really nice beer this one. This was the Old World Russian Imperial Stout at 9.5% ABV from Brewdog in Ellen in Aberdeenshire in the northeast of Scotland. Uh, quite happy I opened this one up uh, as part of the Crazy Beers for 10 years series but this will be the la the second last brood of one 
that you'll see uh, in this series. So I hope you've enjoyed these uh, the opening up these random brew dog beers from a while back. But again, uh, thank you for watching my beer reviews. Until the next time, please like, subscribe, share, all the usual YouTube stuff. Let me know your own thoughts on this beer in the comments section below. Let me know what your favourite beers are from Brewdog as well. And I will no doubt return to these guys again at some point in the very near future. But until the next time, Slanja, Skull, cheers. Thank you for watching. Check out my social media. Check out Brewdog's social media. And I will see you guys in another review very, very shortly. Slanja, Skull, and cheers.